All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. and Welcome back to Vibes, the Virtual Behavioral Economics uh, Seminar. Today, we're very happy to host uh, Ray Peaceman from Boston University. Um, Ray will talk about uh, expected discrimination and the transparency gap, which is joint work with uh, Christine Exley, Judd Kessler, and Matty Toma. As usual, we will have 45 minutes of presentation, followed by 50 minutes of Q&A. During the talk, questions will be limited to clarifying ones, and you can ask them in the chat. Mari, one of Ray's co-authors, is online, and she might answer some of the clarifying questions in the chat. During the Q&A, instead, you'll be able to ask your questions directly to our speaker. That's all from me. Ray, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Uh, first, thank you so much for having me. And second, I should note up front that this is pretty early work. So I'd first of all like to thank the organizers and you, the audience, for indulging us in presenting this relatively early work, um, which we think is really very promising, but not yet um, uh, fully formed. I also think it's useful to note up front the trajectory of the paper um, because it's somewhat different than the order in which I will present it. Um, but that may help you make better sense of what exactly we've chosen to do and what the potential ways forward are. So as I'll come to somewhat later, um, you know, as you all know, um, higher education was presented with a fairly unusual set of circumstances to put it mildly uh, last spring. Um, and like many institutions, Boston University chose to let their students take classes past fail. And uh, what was unusual and interesting to us as researchers is that students were given the opportunity to observe their grade and then decide, do I want to keep this B? or turn it into a pass fail? Do I want to keep this A or turn it into a pass fail? Do I want to keep this D or turn it into a pass fail? What is useful to us in addition to interesting to us as researchers is faculty submitted all of their grades. So these were gathered by the registrar and these were then sent out to students who made the pass fail decision, whether to take it for credit or for a grade, uh, but the registrar, registrar kept the grades. So what we then observe is um, people's decision of whether to be transparent on their transcript about a grade, where we as the researchers know what they are choosing to be more or less transparent about. Now, for reasons I won't get into in the interests of time, we were interested in gender differences in this and some fairly striking gender differences emerged and I'll come to that later. But that got us thinking about why would this transparency gap, what we'll call the transparency gap exist? Why would men and women choose differently and what to reveal about themselves? And that is what led us to what I'll uh, start with and in fact, emphasize, which is concerns about expected discrimination and the implications for what you choose to reveal to future employers, to, um, uh, to potential prospective graduate schools, etc. And that is the focus of this paper is in part I'll describe the observational results later. But I'm really going to focus on the experimental data and the experimental results that focus more squarely on this question of exper expected discrimination. Now, to uh, from the opening motivation, what Goss involved in this, to the very big picture motivation from 20,000 feet, so to speak, about why you might care about this set of questions. Well, you know, investment in skills and training is one of the, like how to encourage this or the extent of it is a central uh, concern in labor economics and development economics. Um, and naturally the extent to which 
workers invest depends on what they expect to get back in exchange for their investments. That is, what are the returns? These returns, in turn, naturally depend on how they think employers uh, will uh, interpret these in, uh, investments. Will they reap the benefits of their investments? And if you anticipate that you're going to be a janitor, regardless of your investment in human capital, maybe you'll choose not to invest in human capital. This is a feature of many um, uh, labor market theory papers sometimes with empirical application. So we note here one of the um, uh, seminal papers on this, Cote and Lowry, which very much has this flavor to it, that the discriminated against group uh, anticipates low returns in the labor market and hence underinvest in education. Their point is that you can then get uh, statistical discrimination emerge in equilibrium because employers are correct to anticipate that the discriminated against group will be of low quality because they didn't invest. And so it's a, um, uh, a vicious cycle that reinforces itself. So what do we do about this? Well, the natural solution is to give the discriminated against group a crystal clear signal to provide to employers. And this is, also kind of a, a topic, an answer to this problem that goes back quite some ways. So the earliest invocation of this we have is from Ken Arrow. I'm sure this idea has been floating around. I'm sure you could find it in Adam Smith somewhere. Um, this idea that you know, the employer would be totally happy to change his course signal on the basis of skin color or some other a readily observable attribute for a um, something better than a group level proxy. So the employer must incur some cost before it can determine productivity. If productivity could be determined costlessly, there'd be no need to use these coarse group level proxies, which are necessarily less valid even under the most favorable conditions. So one insight here is that if you're part of the discriminated against group, you may be more motivated to get the crystal clear signal that informs, um, that informs prospective employers of your ability. If you're a part of the privileged group, that's fine. You, uh, the employer will make a positive inference even in the absence of the, the signal. So we are going to um, test this idea or take a step towards testing this idea um, using a combination of uh, experimental data combined with observational data from uh, students at Boston University. So in the incentivized lab experiment, we'll have a couple of thousand participants where we show that um, uh, one crucial channel for mitigating expected discrimination is with a performance signal. Okay, so discrimination is expected against women, but when uh, those who are thinking about will they be discriminated against are given information on productivity, or sorry, when they know the prospective employer will have information on productivity, they anticipate less discrimination. Um, we then look at, you know, expected discrimination isn't the only explanation for the BU result. It is, was again, like our initial motivation, but one um, uh, real world fact that is consistent with the presence of expected discrimination is that women reveal more. And so what we can at least say is that women reveal more about their performance when performance is known. So it's not just that the men thought before their grades were assigned, oh, I'm going to get straight A's. And women thought, oh, I'm going to get C's. They receive the grade, they compare it to their incoming GPA, and women say, 
Uh, I think uh, the way to think about it is a man and a woman, both with 3.5 GPAs, they each get a B. The man says, I'll just take the past. I don't want to have a B on my transcript. The woman thinks, better take the B, because what will people infer if I, uh, if I have this um, ambiguous signal on my transcript? So this is consistent with women thinking this will reduce discrimination against them, the presence of the finer grain signal. We, uh, at the end, can think about other things that might explain this, but, but it is at least consistent with expected discrimination on the part of women. Um, so our, contri our contributions are twofold. We think we make uh, what is a reasonably crisp um, contribution, if you like, an internally valid um, contribution to kind of, uh, the specific topic of expected discrimination. And then we introduce what we think of as just a pretty interesting fact to the literature that is consistent with expected discrimination. And wherever you think the explanation is for this transparency gap. It's kind of an, it's an interesting fact to, we think, to contemplate. Now there does exist, and you'll note 2020, 2020, 2020, this is a relatively new topic for people to study. Um, so there are a few studies that we are familiar with that look at um, uh, anticipation of discrimination. Um, broadly speaking, these three papers uh, have the following, um, the following punchlines. People do expect discrimination and they expect discrimination even when none exists. We'll see something like that in our data. And if people anticipate discrimination, they don't work as hard. So they're less likely to devote effort uh, to a task and they're less likely to apply for a job if they anticipate, oh, the man will get it. Um, none of the papers, none of these three papers look at the role of information and how, um, information on performance, none, none look at how information on this affects these beliefs about anticipated discrimination. That is, if we introduce a signal, does that change the discriminated against groups willingness to um, supply effort or apply for jobs. And we certainly don't know of work that is comparable to ours in observational data. Um, and as I noted on the previous slide, it can't be that men are choosing to, um, uh, choosing differently about revealing something about future grades because they have different beliefs about what those future grades will be. It's simply they choose to reveal less conditional on everything else that is on their transcript past, past and present um, that one might account for. Um, I was told that I can I stop at various so there is places. A, yes. to, okay. There's a little bit of a question from Nagib Ali. Um, in this context, how should we think about the game theoretic force of unraveling in a disclosure game? Everyone would disclose an A+, plus, which implies that a non-disclosed grade is an A or lower, but then everybody might disclose an A and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I think this alludes to a much um, broader issue, um, which is what assumptions are we making or what, what are we asserting about how BU students think about this, um, what is really a one-time event of disclosing or not disclosing. So I'm interpreting the question fairly literally as it applies to the BU data. Um, what I can say is that um, yeah, it is quite common for people to have relatively high GPAs 
and still keep a B on their transcript. So they're not um, necessarily, you know, it, and, and it's similarly not in, hmm. Maybe it's best to come back to that later on um, after we go through the BU results. Um, in, but I'm not, um, I think this sort of um, unraveling suggests something about how students are thinking about the problem that is beyond uh, kind of the, um, uh, how they approach the game and game, so to speak, and how they think um, their counterparty will interpret the, these grades. I know I've kind of muddled that response, but I, I think it's actually best to come back to it when I show you a bit more detail on, on, um, on those data. Anything else that I should look at or respond to now or just keep going? Um, so uh, I'll bring two questions, yeah. two more questions. Let me know if you want to defer yeah. that to Q&A. Um, so Moses Chayo asked whether you also have on, uh, do you also have uh, raised data? And uh, Boton Kosegi asks, could the transparency gap result from differences in confidence regarding future grades? Men might be prone to thinking yeah. they improve their GPAs and don't want to water that down with the current grade? Yeah, I, I'll address the second question probably when we get to the data, um, and that's probably a bit more straightforward. Sorry, remind me of the first question. Do you also have raised data? Oh, yes, and I, I'm, I think I may, I don't actually think I have a link to the, um, race results. We don't actually observe any substantial differences across race. That was a natural thing to look at. Um, I will say that's not what we were planning to look into when we got the data. We looked at it very much with the intention of looking at gender differences. But once we had the data, which included uh, race identifiers, it was a natural further thing to look at. Um, but you can just assume that if I if I don't have it here to show you, it's just a non-result across races. Thank you. Um, remind me what, I'm not sure why I'm having such a trouble, is such trouble with recall this morning. What was the second question? Because I want to make sure to come back to it. Oh, f uh, confidence about the future. So the extent, the sense in which we'll come back to this is we'll look at differences across freshman, um, junior, um, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Doesn't fully address the, the issue because it could be that I have confidence that, that's, that at some future point after I've graduated, things will all of a sudden turn around for me. But I think broadly speaking, um, you know, this is one reason why we don't want to push um, expected discrimination as the explanation for the, um, uh, the transparency gap result. There are various things that could, could account for it. And I think it's fair to say that I'm not going to say, um, show you anything that um, definitively rules out the sort of confidence story that Boton suggests. Okay, so um, let me turn to, so I'm going to uh, describe the lab experiment. I will then describe the lab results. And then after that, we'll turn to the, to the observational data and results. Okay, so um, the lab experiment has three groups. I will emphasize on several occasions that we're most interested in what we label as job seekers in this presentation. Um, but as we note, a reminder to myself, we never call people these things in the actual experiment. Like they're referred to by more abstract terms. But to kind of think about the setting that the experiment is meant to capture, you have employees and they're 
um, productivity is known. You have employers who know the productivity of employees. Um, and then you have job seekers who are thinking about, how's this employer going to treat me? And so our focus is on the job seekers and we're interested in their beliefs, their second order beliefs, their beliefs about employers' beliefs. Okay, so I will go through all three. It's necessary to talk about the job seeker situation to first talk about employees and employers, but ultimately we're interested in these second order um, uh, beliefs. Another note to myself, just um, you'll see that all of these uh, parts are incentivized and we'll give details that follow. I know some people have differing and strong opinions on this. So employees are going to do a task. They're going to complete two math questions. I'll show you what these look like in a moment of five questions each. Employers will then be given some amount of information on employees and guess whether an employee of a given type performs well on the second test on the basis of some basic demographics, namely gender, and also their performance perhaps on the first test. And then the job seekers are going to guess the beliefs that employers had about employees, okay? And again, a reminder, we're focused on the job seekers, but to get to the job seekers, we first need to talk about what employees do and what employers uh, guess about. Okay, so we will have, recall there were 2,100 subjects. Most of them are job seekers since those are the ones we're most interested in. 300 employees, um, they are um, 150 men and 150 women. There are two people who did not identify as male or female. So we're going to exclude them where relevant. Um, there are no different versions of this. Um, you see the time and pay, payment at the bottom. Okay, so they get, oh, that's a little typo. There are five questions in test two. They're asked 10 questions. Um, the incentive 10 cents for each question. And the questions are pretty simple, or I'm sorry to put it that way, but um, the first version, the pilot had much harder questions and we got a lot of complaints about how difficult the questions were. Um, people get, I can't remember the exact mean, but let's say two and a half questions right on average of the type you see here. So Aisha needs, well, you can read it. Um, it's like fifth grade. Um, fifth grade math, according to New York Common Core. Okay, so now on to the employers and I'll pause at the end of the employers to see if there are any questions about the first two groups before we turn to the main, main group. So employers are going to make guesses about whether a given employee is a quote, good employee, someone who will per perform well on the second test. Okay, I'll go skip this. They are going to answer 18 questions. I'm gonna ignore the first four questions for now. We'll come back to them later. They're only relevant for what is perhaps a, um, an extension if you like. Um, I'm gonna focus on the 14 main questions and as is not uncommon, we're going to pick one randomly selected question and if they did well on that, they get the bonus payment. Okay, the main questions, which I'm going to talk about now, I'll ask whether a selected worker who's selected from the pool of workers with a specific set of attributes had quote, good performance on test two. Now we want to define good performance as a binary measure. So good performance is I pick one of these five questions at random from the specific worker. Did they get it right? If they got it right, that's good performance. If they get it wrong, it's bad performance or it's not good performance. Okay, so we first have no signal and then we'll have something that looks almost exactly like this but there will be one of six signals, getting zero right, getting one right, all the way up to getting five right. Okay, so 
first, it's the entire pool of um, approximately 150 um, workers. Do you think a randomly selected man or woman had a good performance on test two? And the same thing for women, yes or no. And then there's the signal version where in addition to man or woman, they're given information on how well the person did on test one. Any questions to this point? There, there need not be on this. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now the group that we're actually inter primarily interested in, that is... Sorry, there, is there is a question in the, in the chat, uh, which might be good to answer right now. Yeah. Were the red words uh, highlighted in your slides uh, also highlighted the, in the subject screens? I'm pretty sure, but Maddie can jump in and say no if I've got that wrong. Yes, they were. She wrote yeah, in the chat. Yes. Okay, thanks to both. Um, I've already demonstrated my terrible recall broadly, and so I uh, would not claim to remember that accurately. Okay, so uh, um, now the ones we're mainly interested in. Okay, so we're mainly interested in the job seekers, so we have far, far more of them. Also, they're not all going to be assigned to the same uh, group. There are going to be different study versions, and so we'll have 500 each um, to one of three versions. Okay. In a, the versions are not entirely distinct, so there will be a way of pooling all 1,500 for, for the, the main results that follow. Okay, again, the incentives are meant to be roughly commensurate with the, the, the payments to, to the other types. They're going to do 16 questions. We think of them as having, job seekers as having four main questions, which I will focus on um, for the time being. And then 12 additional questions. Um, and the 12 additional questions I'll come back to when I similarly come back to the extra. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to disturb you. Uh, I mean, it's related to the fact that you point out uh, in red. You don't think, uh, I mean, I know you are looking for discrimination, but do you don't think yeah. to, to have a strong demand effect in this way would not be better to have just the first name, for example? Yeah, so what can I tell you? This was something that we have definitely discussed amongst the four of us. I am not an experimentalist, and so it would probably be better if... Christine or Maddie or Judd were presenting, and they would pre present probably a more forceful argument for man or woman, because I actually had a similar reaction. I think the reason to have it is we're not so interested in employers. We're really interested in the job seekers, where I think the demand effects of the sort you describe are less likely to be as serious. It turns out, though, that it may be a bit of an issue for us, because I do think we get something that looks like demand effects for employers' beliefs, because people don't want to appear as um, uh, being prone to gender discrimination. So we'll see, we get a bit of a mismatch across workers, employers, and um, job seekers in a sense, where if we didn't make the labeling uh, in this way, maybe we would have gotten less of that. That's A. B, something that we've talked about doing but have not yet implemented is uh, have a set of employers who are just presented with one of these. Because another issue with, with having uh, a, a um, an employer respond to both of these is the comparison may further exacerbate the sort of demand effect that was just described. I think that's that's fair. Um, and you've actually saved us some time by asking that question because I'm sure it would have come up, uh, or I suspect it would have come up later. 
Okay, so to uh, get back to the job seekers, um, the main questions are all um, focused on the fraction of employees. Sorry. The fraction of employers who thought that a specific employee or worker had good performance on test two. Okay, so recall employers were guessing, did such and such type of worker have good performance? Now job seekers are um, uh, being asked, what percent of employers who were presented with this type of worker, what percent thought that the worker had good performance? So it's beliefs about employers discrimination or beliefs about employers beliefs and they get a dollar if they're within some um, band of the correct answer. Okay, so there are two questions that uh, don't provide any information on performance. Okay, so this is although this is kind of the course signal I'm just using some uh, group level proxy to use arrows terminology to make an inference, man or woman. And then the next two questions differ, these are the three uh, different versions, are given um, questions about two or three or four um, questions right on test one. We don't bother with zero or five because the signal is just too powerful. Like if someone reports that they get, if you hear that someone got zero out of five right on test one, it seems crazy to think that they'll perform well on test two. Are there any questions about the job seekers task? And if not, I will very briefly describe the um, employer, employee and employer results and then turn to um, the details of the, um, the job seekers results. Okay, so the employee result, and as I mentioned in response to the last question, you'll see that there's at least a bit of a mismatch amongst these results in a way that's a bit unfortunate. Um, we are not hiding that, um, but it's also, I will say not any different from what one might, from what one sees in the papers that I cited on expected discrimination earlier. So first, the employee results, men are actually slightly better than women um, in uh, completing these math questions. The p-value is not, um, this is not a crisp difference if you like. Here is the demand effect, if you want to think of it that way. Um, people express a belief that women will outperform men in the absence of just using the group level proxy. Okay, so there is this funny mismatch, which could be explained certainly by uh, demand effects. But again, it's not obvious that we're so concerned with demand effects at this level except in so far as maybe it creates this complicated um, task for the job seekers where they have to perhaps think about whether employers are subject to experiment or demand effects. Then if we add in a signal, there's no difference whatsoever. Okay, so no gender gap conditional um, signal. Now we turn to the job seekers results, which I'll go through one by one. First of all, um, this is the expected discrimination result that is in line with the um, papers I described earlier. Job seekers anticipate the employers anticipate lower performance from female employees. Okay, so uh, job seekers believe that employers suffer from gender discrimination. Second, we'll have the information treatment. 
or the information version, which narrows this gap. And finally, to emphasize that, you know, it's not something peculiar to gender. Like if we put together, as you'll see, a pool of biased employers, people believe that the um, a signal will shrink the bias. Okay, so you'll see how we do that, and that involves the the additional questions that I haven't yet uh, haven't yet described. Okay, so this is our basic specification, where there is a gender gap. The outcome is the gender gap in performance, conditional on information, where information is either you don't have it, you just have the group level proxy, or you have the group level proxy plus the signal. Okay, so it's the subject's belief in uh, expectation of good for performance from men versus women. And this is a function of the constant term, which is just the extent to which they believe there is employers are uh, discriminate. And what our main interest is, how does this um, ex expectation of discrimination, how does it narrow when there is a signal? The rest will kind of bracket for now. I think we're less interested in that. Okay, so again, we're mostly interested in um, beta one. Okay, so first of all, uh, subjects do expect discrimination. Um, job seekers do expect discrimination. That's captured in the constant term. Second, information reduces expectation of discrimination. Okay, so this is, uh, shows how this gap narrows if the information provided is two, three, or four. Now these all should be roughly the same because it's unknown. The only difference across these three is which treatment were you uh, which version of the experiment were you randomized into? So it'd be pretty troubling if there were systematic differences there. Oops. Uh, what is systematically true is that when you provide the signal, um, beliefs in employers, gender discrimination shrinks. Note that it certainly doesn't go to zero, which I think is also interesting in itself. It shrinks the gap, but it certainly doesn't uh, eliminate it. Okay, so this is pooling across all signals. Um, I This is, again, it cuts it about in half. I don't know that I would want to make too much of the fact that you get a larger um, effect here than here or here, um, but this divides the sample up into those that get one of the, the uh, signal of two, signal of three, signal of four. Do you want to pause at this point for questions? I do feel like this is the main result of the experimental part of the paper. Uh, so if there are any questions about so there, this. There are um, only a couple of the qualifying questions that yeah. Mari is answering in the chat. Okay. So you have around the five, uh, seven minutes from now. Okay. So I better let you go and uh, reserve the question okay. for the Q&A. So if I have five minutes, I'm going to skip the um, results on, um, and I'll skip this as well, actually. Can't... Um, I should probably just learn to talk faster. Um, I'll skip the results on how it's symmetric if you tell people these are male versus female biased um, uh, employers. I do want to make sure I have 
five minutes to talk about the BU data and then in the Q&A we can provide more details on any of this as needed. Okay, so one implication of this finding that more information shrinks the gender gap. So it's a greater benefit to women to have the signal than it is for men. Um, women should be willing to disclose more. They should be more transparent uh, since in the absence of it, uh, employers are more apt to make a negative inference about women relative to men. Okay, so um, again, as I've said from the beginning, we don't uh, claim that this provides kind of proof of expected discrimination in a natural setting. What we'll say is it's consistent with our experimental results um, and is an interesting result in and of its fact, uh, in and of itself. So let me give you the fact. Um, so the setting as in many other institutions, I'm not sure how this differed across schools, whether at other schools students were given their grade and then allowed to decide. Um, but uh, students could take credit or no credit in a way that did not affect their GPA as well at all. As I um, emphasized up front, there are two crucial elements to this from our perspective. Students could see their letter grades before deciding which ones to keep and which ones to convert into pass fail. Um, and uh, all grades were submitted, so the registrar kept all grades. So we could observe the grades that were turned into pass fail and those which were kept. Okay, so our basic specification, the outcome is, do you take this grade as credit? We're going to have all sorts of um, uh, uh, variants uh, uh, that try to capture the student's GPA. And mostly what we're going to be interested in is holding everything else constant. Are men more likely to take a pass fail? Let me skip the preamble here. Um, no, Fs are not helpful to us. We'll see that mostly the action is on Bs. This is not surprising. No one converts an A into pass fail. Very few people get a C and don't convert it to a pass fail. Students seem to follow relatively coarse rules on this. And we're going to focus on grades that lower GPA, grades that raise your GPA. People by and large keep. We'll see some effect on those. Um, but most of the action is on uh, grades that potentially lower your GPA. Main punchline is women um, are, are less likely to, uh, to keep, or are less likely to take a, a class pass fail. Sorry, the outcome here is actually keeping the grade uh, rather than taking it for credit. So women are more transparent than men. Um, this doesn't really address Boton's point, but this gives you the um, distance to graduation result and maybe one can revisit the question with this in mind. In fact, is strongest for juniors, non-existent for seniors who already, even in this peculiar year, many of them had jobs lined up. Um, so that makes it seem, at least on the margin, more consistent with um, concerns about uh, uh, career concerns driven almost entirely by um, B grades. We did we, another natural dimension is to look at STEM versus non STEM. Um, we saw no difference there. Okay, so to conclude, um, we think exper uh, expected discrimination, you're going back some decades is seen as an important input into mark, uh, models of um, uh, worker investment and labor market function. Uh, going back at least to Arrow, we see one natural way of trying to mitigate expected discrimination. And that is, you know, you can provide a cleaner signal. You know, if, if I were teaching this to MBAs, um, like, for some reason, um, I might even suggest, you know, this presents a business opportunity, this uh, chance to provide crisper signals. Um, maybe there are ways that uh, testing companies could do this better. Um, 
so you know you can think about this as presenting a chance for um, a missing market for someone to step in and provide the things that I described below. Um, or you can think of them as collective action problems where uh, industry collectively can take steps toward collecting uh, objective productivity information. Job seekers can effectively do what BU's women are doing, which is provide more transparency. Um, and who's going to do this? Well, the people who anticipate they're discriminated against. Um, thanks for your comments thus far, and I'll leave it there. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ray, for a very interesting uh, talk. We're going to start the Q&A section. So if you have a question that you would like to ask uh, to Ray, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask him directly. Um, should I stop the screen sharing now? Would that be helpful? It might be useful to, to keep it just in case you need to go okay. back to the, okay. the slides. Let's see. Are there any questions? The chat was very active, so let me check. Uh, okay, so Konstantinos Yunaidis has a question. Go ahead. And... Um, hello, and thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, one, one question I had was whether there are any data to look at whether the fact that women were more transparent in their grades benefited them in actually finding a job or did it possibly backfire? Do we have any kind of data on what happened after that? Um, I, I think that that is... Uh, surveys. Um, but I think more to the point, sorry, it seems we have some technical issues. Um, Matty, would you like to step in? Oh, I, I think you can hear me now, yes? Yes, yes. Um, yes, we can now, yes. I think more to the point, it's hard to tell whether it harmed or hurt them because yeah, we, these are, so even if we had, even if this were like a very decisive action in the job market, so forget the signal to noise issues. Um, and even if we had perfect uh, information on um, job placements, still hard to know what to make of it precisely because it's observational data and these are choices that are made um, in kind of, we, we don't know that it harms or hurts them because uh, we, never, we never got to randomize disclosure. That's what we would need to do. We would need to randomize disclosure for men, randomize disclosure for women and see whether disclosure harmed or hurt women. What we're interested in here is in fact, or what we document here is just the choice as opposed to the ultimate consequence of it. Okay, Annette, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask Ray a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi. Um, so there was a little bit of discussion in the chat, but I, I thought it ended up being like something that's maybe easier to discuss, or at least in terms of I could understand the design a bit. To what extent can you get expected discrimination from job seekers second order beliefs if you don't have their first order beliefs? So it sounded like it's quite complicated in the sense that you ask, what did the, you ask the job seekers what they believe about the employer's beliefs. However, if for some reason the job seekers believes, believe that women will do worse, 
then they would naturally think that the employers would also think that. Hence, it wouldn't be expected discrimination. Right? And yeah. I must have misunderstood that. And, and also- No, I, 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 yeah, I, sorry, go ahead. Um, what, what would have been useful, I don't know if you have that somewhere, your design seems quite complex, but um, whether you uh, made the belief at some point conditional on a score. So conditional on this score, um, what is, you know, holding constant the, the, the true performance, what, do, what will the employers believe? Like that would have, I think that Sorry, would I definitely get the first part of the question. I'm not sure I followed the second part. It's just a clarification on the first. So I think if you really wanted uh, expected, like if you wanted expected discrimination to be clean, if I'm thinking right, uh, you would have to say uh, for, uh, no, for women with that average score, now hang on, I need, n never mind the second okay. point. I have to think about okay. that myself a bit more. So I think I take the first part to, to be related to the awkwardness of some of the mismatch between the results on employers, employees, and job seekers. Because just imagine, if you will, that you found that um, employees, there was no gender difference. And you know, to some extent, that's true. Like the, the gender differences among employees are pretty modest. And then suppose that you found that these people who are randomly assigned to be employers were biased against women. Then that kind of provides you an expectation, the first order beliefs of the, um, of the job seekers. And the awkwardness is we think that the first order beliefs are polluted by these kinds of um, social desirability or experiment or demand effects. And that's, that's why we're thinking about going back and redoing some of the uh, employer, or at least doing another round of the employer um, uh, version in a way that is less prone to this concern. Because if the results had been as I described them, there's some chance that you wouldn't even be thinking about this question. Maybe you still would be, but I, I think I'd have a much easier response to it. Okay, thank you. Najib, your turn, thank you. Excellent, uh, thanks so much for a, a great talk. Um, um, I'm trying to square this again with thinking about unraveling. And now I expect that all BU undergraduates have not read Grossman and Milgram um, and all employers haven't either. But the question in some sense to me is what do students think when they choose to conceal a grade? Like, Do they expect that employers simply don't notice that there's a pass fail on the transcript and so it's almost treated as if something that didn't lower their GPA. Um, but that's sort of like, I, I was wondering if there's any way in which uh, you have knowledge or understanding of what it is that students anticipate um, employers' response or how people would respond to a transcript that has grades concealed. Yeah, I, I think the short answer is um, like, Maybe the most useful thing I can do is tell you about a few conversations I've had with actual BU undergraduates who uh, I don't know which parts of our sample they are, um, but they were in my class last year. And the gender differences were actually intriguing and instructive. Um, I'm not totally, I don't know how much further this gets us in um, kind of being able to write down what we think the right model is. What I heard from um, my in-person students, so this is a small sample because not many people came to class in person, um, but I remember chatting about this one day. Um, uh, the two schools of thought were like essentially what you described, like they're not even gonna notice. And so I'm gonna be able to um, sneak this pass fail past them. 
And the other is, oh, it, it relates to your unraveling point. Like, what are they going to think if I chose to take it pass fail? And at least in my N of, I don't know, three or four, there was a gender divide in these beliefs. Um, so it, this alludes to yet another reason why you could get this result in the data, which is not about uh, differences in, it's not about expected gender discrimination. It's just that women have this, at least in my sample of three, this belief that uh, people are going to make this negative inference from pass fail, whereas men think, oh, I'm going to sneak it past them. But it's really like it's hard to, at some point in the not too distant future, we're going to have to take a stand on some of what we think is going on because we do kind of need to write down some structure or provide some structure for thinking about the experimental results. But given that we haven't written that down, I suspect the anecdotes from behavioral economics, uh, 11 a.m. section, it's the best I can do. All right, so if there are no more questions, since it's uh, two to six uh, here in Milan, I'd say our time is up. Okay, no more questions. Our questions in the chat that we will uh, share with the with the speakers later on. Thank you, Ray and Maddie, for a super interesting talk. Uh, thank you, everybody else, uh, for a stimulating discussion and for attending. Um, our next talk is the last talk of the semester in uh, two weeks from today, Tuesday, May the 25th, with Andy Kaplan from NYU, and we hope to see you uh, there again. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you all.